Thanks, Bridget. And I think this case study should feed quite nicely into what Meredith has just gone through with us. Um, the Australian Racing Museum received a Community Heritage Grant to have a significance assessment carried out in 2010. Uh, we engaged two professional historians to, to do the work for us. Both of them had um, knowledge and experience of the, the thoroughbred racing industry, which is how we came to, to them. I thought it might be useful just to talk through the process that we, that we went through with, with our assessors. Um, as they worked through the significance assessment process. There were eight on-site visits um, and numerous telephone discussions and emails um, as they worked through what they, the information that they needed in order to do the assessment. They started with a really clear outline of, of how they were going to undertake the assessment, um, multiple questions to get a, a broad understanding of the museum. Um, and our museum has gone through some, some transitions it was first conceived in 1974, but didn't officially open until 1981 at Caulfield Racecourse. And at that point, it was the Victorian Racing Museum. It moved to Federation Square in 2004 as the Australian Racing Museum, and then to the National Sports Museum in 2010 with the exhibition space, the Champions Thoroughbred Racing Gallery. And these different phases have really impacted the, um, the history and the development of the collection. They looked at the scope of our collection and broke it down into um, types and themes. And so artworks form a, a quite a large part of our collection. So paintings, lithographs. There's quite a large photographic collection. There's some lovely trophies. Um, this one is quite significant. It's the 1890 Melbourne Cup won by Carbine. And this is just part of it. It's, it's actually seven pieces. So this is just the two, two pieces. And then these don't, don't look particularly important, but they're race books. Um, you buy them at race meetings now for about $6, um, but they actually contain some fantastic research um, materials. So particularly these, these older ones where, where you lose information about fields, about owners, trainers, um, colours. Um, as part of the assessment, they also sent out a questionnaire to a small number of researchers who use our collection and to associates and friends of the, the museum, asking um, a number of questions like, how often do you visit or contact the museum? Uh, does the museum reflect the history of racing in Australia? And in which ways does it do this? Um, it asked them which other museums or collections of thoroughbred racing material they were familiar with. And that's just a couple of examples. They also looked at how the collection was used for research and exhibitions. And from this produced a comprehensive report for the, the collection as a whole rather than for specific objects. Um, and this was, of course, based on the significance document that Meredith has been taking us through. So I thought maybe just to look at a couple of the, um, so it, I should say it was uh, an assessment for the entire collection, but when they came to, to looking at the, the criteria, they did actually specify particular objects within it. So in terms of, of artistic or aesthetic significance, there were, actually, I'll go back to that one. Um, these were really popular in the, uh, the 19th century, um, memorials for, um, significant horses. Um, but this they thought was an example of, of uh, accomplished silversmith skills. And then this was again a, another um, popular 19th century craft and it was weaving hair and it was done in human hair but this one is horses hair. Um, and this is using the tail hair of Archer who was the winner of the first two Melbourne Cups in 1861 and 1862. Um, in terms of scientific and research significance, um, the collection contains some really valuable insights into technological advances in equipment. Um, for example, the changes in fabrics that have been used in um, saddles, um, protective strength of, of helmets. And if you see some of the early helmets, they're just leather skull caps. And so now you've got the most incredible um, helmet protection. There's also horse, uh, horseshoes and racing plates that have really improved in um, 
quality as well. In terms of social and spiritual significance, they, um, they established that items associated with the Melbourne Cup were very significant. Um, in addition to objects associated with Farlap, which isn't surprising. Um, so they have a really strong social resonance. This is um, Tommy Woodcock's Mexican identification card that he took with him when Farlap went to, um, to America and Mexico in 32. Um, this is the Thoroughbred Yearling Sales um, catalogue when Farlap was sold in New Zealand as a, as a yearling. Um, the bridle and racing plate that was worn in Agua Caliente. And this is a, an interesting one. It's a Chapman and Sons horse float, which we're not entirely sure whether it actually ever transported Farlap, but it's, it's of the right date, um, so possibly it did. Meredith was also talking about the, um, the secondary criteria. And the, there's a couple that I just wanted to, to point out for that. We, we know that they've got historic significance, but some of them with the, um, with the provenance it, when it's quite strong, including um, the presentation box of, of Wakeful's tail hair, a microphone used by a race caller, Bill Collins, and Tullock's heart. They also looked at, and Meredith didn't, didn't discuss this at all, the Australian Historic Themes Framework, aha, um, which I won't go into, but if anybody wanted to see a copy of our significance assessment and see what that contains, they'd be, be more than welcome to. Um, our assessors undertook a comparative analysis of national and state collecting institutions and major racing clubs to compare what they held in their collection with what we had in ours. And during this information together, they developed a statement of significance, which highlighted the strengths of the collection, but also pointed out the, the holes in our collection, which has been really valuable for us. They also made a number of general and specific recommendations on future directions for the collection, and they've also been, been of great use, and I'll go into those in just a, just a moment. At the time that the significance assessment was completed, so it was completed in May 2011, it was a really valuable tool for us and it actually continues to be. It followed a period of significant change with the closure of Champions at Federation Square and the move to the Champions Thoroughbred Racing Gallery at the National Sports Museum. The timing presented the museum with the opportunity to refocus on the collection, to better understand the strengths to actively collect in particular areas identified as gaps, um, to increase the national focus of our collection, which as you remember for the first 20 years was Victorian based. Um, for looking at digitising for access and reduced object, object handling and considering alternative means of making the collection accessible, such as through online exhibitions. Uh, the report has highlighted the strengths of the collection content um, and defined our place within the thoroughbred racing industry and strengthened our position as a repository for objects relating to the history of, of racing. I thought it might be useful just to quickly touch on, on how our significance assessment has, has helped in, in various processes, day-to-day -day processes. And what it has done is emphasised and backed a lot of the ideas that, that had been surfacing over a number of years of, of working with the collection. And the, the general recommendations have been really, really useful for us and helping us to refine the ways we think about collecting. Um, and this will impact our revised collection policy that we're currently working on. It's made us more conscious of our national mandate and that moved from the Victorian Racing Museum to the Australian Racing Museum and, and to readdress that as much as we can in our collecting. And this won't be news to anyone here, but it's been really helpful in, in reminding us that we need to be selective when acquiring objects. Um, and we have that legacy from early days of objects that just don't fit within our collection policy. Some specific recommendations that have been useful for us have been to institute oral history project. And this was rolled out as part of a, an exhibition we worked on last year, um, Racing Style, 50 Years of Fashions on the Field. Um, another specific recommendation was to digitise collection objects, um, to prioritise the most significant objects, 
and this has also become part of our ongoing documentation process. So when objects are catalogued, when they go on display, for example. And another specific recommendation was to fill the gaps in the collection, uh, including objects related to fashion and race wear, and more specifically, objects relating to recent and current champion horses. And this was one of the big gaps was, that was noticed, that we have a lot of material of past champions, but very little of, of current champions. So doing that contemporary collecting. Um, I thought I might also quickly touch on if it's changed our exhibitions and collections in any way. And I think the significance assessment really validated the strength of our fashion, millinery and racewear collection. And when 2012 was identified as the 50th year since the first Fashions on the Field competition, we were keen to develop a temporary exhibition. That's it there. The exhibition drew on a number of collection objects and oral histories that had been done in the past, in addition to a number of new oral histories. Um, it allowed us to touch base with a, a whole new range of, of stakeholders um, and to look beyond, beyond our our core focus of, of sporting history to, to fashion, to millinery, to a, a more social history. Another recommendation was to uh, instate a schedule for ongoing conservation work. And keeping the millinery collection in mind, we started work on rehousing our millinery. And there's about 400 um, objects in our collection of, a, of, um, of millinery, and so, Claudia here is working on creating new supports, on custom making boxes, and it was a really difficult job given the size of some of the hats in our collection. Some of the boxes that she was making were as big as this area that you'll see here. And so just to quickly come back to that contemporary collection, collecting that we're now focusing on, um, this has really emphasised, been emphasised in the last couple of years with a horse called Black Caviar that you might be familiar with. Um, and our knowledge that we have to collect things now as she's, as she's racing or as she's finishing racing so that it will be available in our collection for, for the future. I'd like to know, did, with the black caviar, are people donating or are you having to go out and bid and... Uh, we're, we're being quite active in approaching people. Mm. Um, we, there's been a lot of ephemeral material that's been produced with black caviar, more so than any other horse in history. It started probably with Maccabi Diva. I don't know if you remember the, um, the cardboard cutout masks that were produced then. And rolling on from that, there's been a lot of, a lot of ephemeral material that's been produced for um, race days. So we're collecting all of that, but also actively approaching people we know have, have objects that we'd be keen to put our hands up for. In a very gentle way. Thank you for your presentation. Very interesting. Um, I'm just curious, how is Tullock's heart uh, preserved? Uh, the image didn't seem to ha be, I, I didn't perceive a liquid or anything like that. I'm just kind of curious about yeah, the object. Yeah. It, it was actually, um, done for us by the, um, the veterinary school at um, the University of Melbourne. Um, it's in a perspex box and it is actually floating within a liquid and it's a, a mix of glycerin and formalin, I believe it is. We, we then went through the process of having another heart preserved um, when we were about to open as part of the um, Champions Thoroughbred Grace Racing Gallery at the National Sports Museum, a comparative heart that we wanted to, to put side by side to show the differences in size. And so that one we actually um, took to Museum Victoria and they very kindly offered to, to preserve it for us using that same technique of a perspex box um, and then the, the liquid that it is suspended in. That one wasn't quite so successful though and it, it, it wasn't correctly sealed so it started to to grow all kinds of things inside of it. <laughs> um, I, I think probably not. It was it was a good project to to go a, a good process to go through, but I think it was um it was a little bit more time consuming than we'd anticipated and a little harder than we we thought. And sorry, and and I guess the 
when you saw them side by side, we thought there might have been a, a huge difference. Um, and they really, there was, but it wasn't, it wasn't massive. Oh, what comparison? <laughs> oh, let me see if I can find that. Um, I thought somebody might ask me, and I thought I'd have some notes here. I might have to get back to you later, though. It, it is, it's comparable. Is it? Yeah, I think it's, I think it's slightly less, but I think it's comparable. Mm. I can look it up for you, though. Lauren, did you change the collect, um, the exhibition completely from when you moved from Fred Square? to the National Sports Museum? We, we did. We, did. We, um, we rethought the themes and the stories that we wanted to tell, and the space was a, a, um, a consideration for us. It was going to be a much, a much smaller space, but a very different way of displaying objects, so much more object-rich. Um, so we were, we were keen to, to rethink about the themes, um, and I guess reposition what we wanted to tell about thoroughbred racing history. Uh, so, yeah, there, there, was, there was quite a change. And um, how did you, did you apply for a grant for your significance assessment? We did, we did. It was a community heritage grant, um, mm. which was a really wonderful way of having this, this process done for us. Um, we then, uh, the following year, applied for a, a grant to have a, a preservation needs assessment done, uh, which was, again, a fantastic opportunity for us to have that, that work done on the collection. The racing world's a pretty, uh, it seems to me, as an outsider looking in, that it's quite a closed shop. You know, there's a lot of families that have been involved in mm. it for a long time. A lot of people have been interested in it since they were children, mm. right through the whole age. So when the museum was first being set up, um, was there was there sort of a, a grapevine of, of everyone knowing where all of the significant things were in certain families around the state? And did that make this... Did that, did that sort of knowledge that you could draw on from this kind of community inform this uh, significance assessment when you got around to doing it? Um, what the community valued and the stories that they thought were important? Yeah, in some respects, yes. So that, that questionnaire that was, that was sent out as part of the, the significance assessment um, approached researchers of the collection but also um, friends of the museum. And a lot of those were people who'd been involved in the racing industry for for some time whose family had been involved. And so as part of that, they were able to, to say whether they thought the collection was significant and, and what parts of it were significant. So that was a great way to get, to get their input into this, into this process. Lorinda uh, Dennis from Peterborough. Um, my question is, uh, how, do you, your, how does your museum rate yourself with those, these types of museums overseas? Have you heard of racing museums in England and America, for instance? And if you are, you know, if there are, how do you rate yourself against them? Oh, Dennis, that's a good question. Um, we are familiar with racing museums over in England and the US, and they've got some really, um, really strong museums over there. This significance assessment didn't look beyond Australia, so it really was just looking within, within Australia and um, our, our assessors did look at, at all states, but I think in terms of what they were trying to assess us for was how we were able to tell the story of racing in Australia, which is I think why they put that, that limit to it. Um, some of our staff have been to visit museums overseas, the racing museums overseas, and have reported really fantastic things about them, so um, it's something we'd love to, we'd love to look at more. Sorry, I don't know that that answers your question, though. Uh, yes, it does pretty well. Uh, you know how uh, racing is, is very much part of Australian culture. Mm -hmm. uh, when you talk to people overseas, they're into, they're into uh, motor car racing or soccer or, or those other silly things, but, but most Australians got an opinion about horse racing, so it's part of our culture. Yeah. Yeah, I think you're right. We, um, we had a lovely, lovely discussion with a visitor a couple of days ago, and her family... Um, had grown up just beside Flemington. And she said, and it was, it was so right that, that living there and, and associating, with, associating with all of these people, it was the, you know, the highest and it was the lowest. And you know, that that's, sounds a bit rude, doesn't it? But it really is. The, I think the racing, racing world encompasses people from, from everywhere and all, all classes. Yeah. 